hard question to answer simply. So historically, we did, we meaning humans, did train up states of consciousness. It's only been since the enlightenment when we started to privilege kind of rational thought, this kind of, you know, one state of consciousness as, as predominant that we sort of lost this ability. And, you know, the, one of the points made in Stealing Fire is a great many of the so-called skills we want in the 20th century, creativity, learning, flow, these sorts of things, they're not skills. They're states of consciousness. To, uh, to be creative, the brain changes. All a state is is a global change in brain function. Right, it's a global change in, in in the brain. A skill may be isolated in one specific thing. You're talking about a global change in brain function. So we are not used to training it because we haven't done it. Right, most of the skills that that we train up these days are are much are, are much different. Um, but we know how to do it. We've done it historically, and you know, if you go into you know all the wisdom traditions when they're using things like mindfulness practices or, or different forms of prayer and meditation and things like that, those are state changing technologies. So um, it's not that there isn't you know long history here. It's that we've gotten away from it for three hundred years, but we're coming back to it kind of across the boards because we're starting to understand that the so called skills we need are actually accessible through states, right? Mm cooperation and collaboration and communication these are skills that people talk about but they're really state shifts and if you if, if you think about like when you go out to dinner with your friends and you're just talking versus when the conversation gets really good and you sort of lock in and start to get lost in it and right what happens everything inside you get it's a shift everything inside you changes it's not just that you're focusing more on what your friend is saying it's the emotions of it engagement all these different things it's been a it's been a global shift so you're shifting state to improve collaboration communication cooperation we just don't think of it that way i think that's super helpful the the distinction between state and skill and one of the ways that i've heard you describe it or write about it before is that training a state is just a more systemic intervention you get the state right and then a, a wide variety of more specific skills are going to be amplified as a result of that well the state i mean that's exactly correct that's just yes yes what <laughs> rian said we got there for for example um you know any, anyone is going to be better at, at coding or writing or speaking when in flow. Yes, is, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and some of this is, right, flow is what happens, among other things, anything you do, conducting an interview for a podcast, there are 20 or 30 sub skills that go into conducting a good interview. There is a whole research process that is underneath it. There is how do you speak? There's understanding the technology. How do you edit? These are all skill sets, right? Them, themselves, but you, and you have to learn them all independently. Flow is sort of what happens when you take all this stuff that you've learned independently and then the brain can use it together all at once. It's a bunch of skills that come up together at once and are all sort of being automatized. You've trained up the individual skills to the level that you can now do them at an unconscious level and they all sort of come together at, at once in a mm -hmm. higher level. So flow amplifies everything kind of just by design. Right, that makes total sense. And that's, I, I think, one of the reasons why training states and, and flow specifically is becoming increasingly important as technology accelerates because the the diversity of specific skills we need to be able to be good at is constantly expanding and so by getting the the kind of fundamental underlying piece right the ability to drive well, yourself into the right state yeah i mean able. let's let's not kid ourselves i don't care what it is that you're trying to learn if i jack up your motivation and productivity if i jack up your creative problem solving skills and i amplify learning meaning literally i make it easier for you to take information in from short term memory and store it long term right those are all the things flow brings among others those are the things that flow bring everything you're going to be doing therein will be amplified 
Right. No, that makes total sense. And it's about, the most important thing is this. The human brain, the u- humans, the human brain evolved to perform in peak states, right? Flow is universal. It shows up in anyone and anywhere provided certain initial conditions are met because this is simply how evolution shaped humans to perform at their best. You need peak performance. Flow was what we, how we developed that skill. It doesn't matter what you're doing inside the thing, right? The brain is very conservative by design. So does it want to optimize? Well, you're going to have to fight over here to survive. You're going to have to hunt and gather for resources, or you're going to have to know how to hunt and gather for resources once the seasons change and the game disappears. Or right, there's a lot of different things you're going to know how, need to know how to do. So you can, those are all individual skills. You can get better at them over time, but evolution shaped a state change mm-hmm. that increases productivity, learning, creativity, et cetera, et cetera, to amplify it across the boards. Mm. It's, a, it's kind of a global tool, right? Yeah, no, totally. That makes, yeah, exactly. Global tools, a nice way to put it. So one of the amazing things I think that you've done is popularize flow and then use action and adventure sports athletes as a case study for flow in a certain sense. Can you talk a little bit about, firstly, why action or adventure sports athletes make such a great case study for flow and then how we can reproduce those same states outside of flow when we decouple the activity from the state and understand the underlying triggers. You don't mean outside of flow, you mean outside of action and adventure sports. Sorry, outside of those activities, outside of those activities, yeah. So I, I think I did. I think I sort of did flow a great service by writing rise and talking about action adventure sport athletes. And at the same time, I did people a great disservice. And the service was I chose action adventure sport athletes for a very simple reason, which is how do you know, we don't have a biophysical based flow detector at the flow research collective on, you know, we have a research agenda and the next stop, what are we doing? What are we researching? What are we, well, the first thing we're trying to do is build a biophysical based flow detector, something that can measure biological, neurological, and physiological signals and say, hey, you're in flow. Right now, we have psychological questionnaires, and they're squishy, and they're subjective, and they're extremely well validated, and we really like them, and we use them, and they're ubiquitous in the field. But I if, if you want to know for absolute certain is somebody in flow, action adventure sport athletes are a great example because the level of performance has gone up so high that at the upper level, it's almost impossible to do what these people are doing if they're not in flow. So it gave me a very hard data set. I could trust that my research subjects were in flow if they survived. Uh, you know, in, in Rise of Superman, I mm-hmm. said, you know, at the upper level, you know, if you're skiing in Alaska uh, and you're a professional skier and, and you're doing big mountain skiing with a helicopter rise kind of thing, if you're not in flow at the top, you know, by the time you're at the bottom, chances are you're going to the hospital. 